So uh, we should be live uh, now, I hope, uh, in, uh, in YouTube. I hope uh, you can all see us. And uh, today we have uh, another DUPC2 webinar. It will be the last one before the summer break. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, going from emergency remote teaching to real uh, e-learning and what that means. And we have a very special guest today. We have uh, Walid uh, Mulahoum from Algeria. I hope I pronounce it well. He's also an alumnus uh, from IHC Delft. Uh, he studied in the Groundwatch program and he works now for a, a company in Algeria, uh, which he will introduce himself also um, uh, on, on GIS courses. And of course, he also had to do the transition from emergency remote teaching to, uh, to e-learning. And uh, he will give a nice presentation on um, all the challenges and opportunities that that brings. Um, I will start with a presentation on, um, on the, the theory behind uh, e-learning and what makes the difference between emergency remote teaching and real uh, online teaching. After my presentation, there will be a short moment for questions. We have uh, Nadine Sander uh, from uh, the DFC2 uh, coordination team. And uh, she will take your questions from the chat. If you can introduce yourself in the chat, your country, and uh, you can post there your questions, then uh, between our presentations of uh, Walid and me, there will be uh, room for questions. And after uh, Walid's uh, presentation, we'll open the floor for more questions and hopefully we can have a lively uh, debate about this. Um, so uh, let's get started. So I'm going to open a, a presentation. There we go. So the title is From Emergency Remote Teaching to E-Learning. But first, we need to define what we are talking about. And well, basically, what we have been doing since the start of the COVID crisis is moving quickly our education to an online mode. And in that online mode, uh, we try to stay as close as possible to the face-to-face -face, uh, modality where we have our students in class, we present our lectures and we do other things in class. And basically the uh, emergency remote teaching became uh, a replacement of face-to-face, -face, but then with also the same means and learning methods, sometimes blended, which is already a bit better. And also with the idea to return to the old situation, to the old normal uh, back again after the crisis. There's been a very nice uh, article written about this. Uh, the link is uh, here in the corner, but uh, we will provide uh, the links also later. Um, the DUPC2 program also has a knowledge exchange platform. We will provide the link uh, that you also use, uh, by the way, for registration. And there you'll find a lot of resources. And this one is also mentioned there. It gives a nice overview. And basically, my presentation today is a summary of, uh, of part of that article. So the pros of emergency remote teaching where you change your classes to um, uh, to streaming using using tools to, to stream your classes that you normally do live is that it's quickly to set up. So ideal for emergency situations, your materials are ready. You don't need to adapt it to the online uh, format. But um, on the other hand, there's no long term strategy. So you might want to use this time to invest into real e-learning. I'll explain what that means. And uh, that it fits into a longer term strategy of your organization to better cope with these situations, but also to deal with uh, different markets that uh, need real online self-based courses, for example. And in the end, it uh, can increase your uh, efficiency uh, by doing more and more online self-based and using the face-to-face -face or the streaming for certain activities. We're going to talk about it. Um, and by emergency remote teaching, also there's a high risk of uh, reducing the quality of the learning experience uh, because it's no longer aligned with the means. And um, there can be all kinds of uh, technical issues, but uh, also the format is not uh, always appropriate for a good learning experience. So we're going to talk about that. So let's look at designing real e-learning, which is not simply streaming your lecture in class. And there's a lot of uh, things that I'm going to uh, quickly go over. And it comes also from an article. You can see the link here. It's, it's mentioned in the other article. And the first thing that we need to look at is which modality are we going to use? 
Are we going to go fully online? Do we use it in blended form? So remember maybe that blended means that you do a part online uh, and a part in class. And uh, the advantage is that people can do certain parts in their own time or at their own pace. And the in-class parts are then uh, live where you can uh, do certain quizzes or interact in other uh, interactive, interactive ways with the, with the participants. That part can also be streamed. So blended can also be live streaming plus uh, self-paced online. There's also a complete web enabled face to face and that's more close to the emergency remote teaching that we do. So you have these choices. Here you see an example where I used a big blue button to teach a GIS, which was a live stream of a long boring lecture, which could be done in a different way where people can uh, watch these theory uh, lectures in their own time. And we use the, the streaming time to do uh, to take questions and answers and to do quizzes. Then the instructor can take different roles. You can be an active instructor online. So you are continuously present and you tell them each time what to do, your participants. But you can also reduce that and uh, let more things to the uh, participants themselves. It, of course, depends on your group. Uh, I often hear that from colleagues that uh, students are expecting that we are there all the time and holding their hand and uh, doing that. Uh, but I think it's also a good time for the learners to get used to different modes of learning, although they might be not used to that uh, from the past. There's also a big new group of learners, the millennials, who are very much used to look at full video clips, watch uh, video clips on their mobile phone and use that as a learning experience. And um, yeah, if you can combine that with a smaller presence online where you only do quizzes and take questions and answers, that, that might be a good uh, way. You could also opt for no uh, online presence where you only interact with uh, the participants through uh, fora, which might be useful in, in some cases too, where you are in different time zones. It also relates to the pacing. So you can design your course as completely self-paced where people can start any moment in time and finish it any moment in time. Uh, it can be class-based that you give certain dates when you uh, handle certain uh, topics and that everybody has to stick to the same uh, schedule. And you can also do a combination of both. Then in your classes, the students can have different roles. They can there be to just listen or read instructions, which is probably the most boring uh, thing to line. They can also complete problems or, or answer questions that they can do by themselves in an online uh, course um, or even step further, explore simulation and, and resources and, and really make the learning experience much uh, wider than just absorbing a theory that is uh, posed to them. And uh, also a very good way is to, uh, to collaborate with peers, flipped classroom uh, methods where uh, you give the students really a, a big task in the learning experience to exchange knowledge among each other. Then you have to take care about the student instructor ratio uh, because that determines the design. So if you have small groups, you can of course uh, have more interaction uh, with them. Uh, but if you have groups of larger than thousand, uh, which are typically for MOOCs, then you need to look for other ways. And uh, like this webinar where we always expect thousands of uh, people, I don't think they're in the room now, but then uh, you can't have continuous interaction and you need a different mode, a webinar kind of mode to uh, deal with uh, the participants. So you have to take care about this ratio. This is an example of a MOOC we gave in the Every Alliance project uh, with lots of uh, participants. Then there's the concept of uh, synchrony. So asynchronous means that uh, you don't have live stream, but people do things at their own pace in their own time. They can watch video clips, answer questions, and uh, they don't need to follow a strict uh, schedule. You can also do synchronous only. So everybody is in a live stream, uh, big blue button session, for example, in Moodle, where you uh, give your classes and they do the exercises and you're still present and everybody has to reach the targets at the same time. You can also blend these things in a more blended learning mode. So this is especially important if your uh, participants 
come from many different locations and different time zones. This was from a webinar uh, where I uh, was invited by the Australian Water School and we had more than 1,000 people registered from all over the world. And yeah, for some very unpleasant uh, uh, to do that in the middle of the night. And you can imagine that the learning experience will suffer if uh, you are in a very different time zone than your, uh, some of your learners. And then asynchronous teaching is a, a much better option. Then there's the pedagogy uh, that you use. So being uh, expository, uh, do a lot of practice or let uh, students explore things more or be collaborative. It's very much related to the learner uh, role, the student role. So you have to take care of that in your design. And what kind of feedback are you going to give? Is it fully automated where you, you can do that in certain things when it's very, uh, it's about physical equations and mathematics or really uh, black and white answers. Do you want a teacher to, uh, um, to grade it uh, manually? Then it's more work, but uh, often necessary. Or do you want to do a peer uh, review where uh, the students uh, mark each other and then report on that and maybe present that in a live session? So there's, a, there's some options there too. And finally, you need to assess if the learning objectives have been uh, achieved. So there can be different things that you want to uh, assess, which relates a lot to the learning objectives. And in an online system, you can give uh, get feedback from a system if the student is ready for new content. That's when there's content tracking. When somebody finishes something, a new topic will open up. Or the system uh, will tell how to support the students with uh, adaptive instructions. It can also provide the student or the teacher with information about the learning state, it can give input to the grades, and it can also identify students uh, which have a high risk of failure. So you use it in those last cases more as a dashboard uh, for monitoring your students' progress. So all these things can be used in different combinations, not that just picking one from each will give uh, the best course that you can give, but it's something you need to be conscious about that you can uh, really uh, think of by uh, planning and designing your course, which is very important. I'll give a few examples about uh, practice. So what you can do in an asynchronous way is uh, building your uh, e-learning environment by combining uh, quizzes with uh, video, with theories, and then about uh, a yeah, walkthrough course where they have to do different steps with, uh, with software, for example. Another good way uh, which works well in programming classes is that uh, you use these so-called Jupyter Notebooks. Jupyter Notebooks are uh, websites, interactive websites where you can do theory and you can also execute programming code like uh, Python in this case. So the students get something explained and they can try that uh, in the, the gray box and they can run it. And uh, yeah, if it works, they get response from the, the page interactively, like a graph or a map or some, some other feedback. Or it gives an error from the programming language, which they should also then solve while that error is happening. So Jupyter Notebooks are also great ways for uh, online teaching of uh, programming, for example, or concepts of programming. Now, for a synchronous, um, well, I'm of course not a big fan of streaming your uh, lectures, uh, but you can use the synchronous mode and the blended learning uh, to do quizzes, like these uh, Kahoots. There's a free version of Kahoot or Mentimeter where you can uh, ask your learners questions and uh, yeah, you will see that they are very enthusiastic to participate in quizzes and especially with uh, groups that are not very vocal, it, uh, it works well. Uh, it also works well in class if you do that uh, between your lectures. Uh, in my classes, I use it a lot and they can win a, a sticker uh, they can put on their laptop. So that, uh, that works great. Now then, what is the way uh, forward with all these, uh, this knowledge? Let's have a look. Something that I implicitly uh, uh, mentioned in this presentation uh, was the alignment. So when we, uh, we all at IHC Delft have to uh, follow uh, the uh, university teaching qualification courses. And uh, a very important part of that is the concept of constructive alignment, 
where the learning objectives need to be aligned with the assessment and the activities that you do with the students. And if you go to online, you have a, a different set of ac potential activities that you can do, as uh, also described a bit in the different uh, uh, modes that you could use. So you have to revise that when you go from uh, your face-to-face -face classes to online, that you have different options, like these quizzes, for example, and that you don't have to do everything in the same way. So if you keep in mind uh, this alignment, then you will uh, probably be more successful in uh, designing your course. So to conclude that uh, high e-learning requires a long-term strategy. So it's not just getting your stuff online because of an emergency, but it, it can really contribute to a good learning experience and different target groups that are not able now to follow our face-to-face -face classes to learn in the future uh, our uh, materials. Um, it needs a proper planning and design with uh, taking care of the constructive alignment. And uh, the DOPC2 program offered uh, an uh, online course on uh, planning and design of uh, online courses. And uh, if there is another uh, desire uh, from, from people, uh, we, can, we can open again a course for that. Um, and it, it really helps you to plan and design your uh, online course. You need uh, knowledge of e-learning tools. Uh, so that's uh, often where it starts, that there's a lack of knowledge and uh, you just start using uh, uh, tools that you know to stream your lectures. But there's a lot of uh, nice things in Moodle interactivity that you can use. You need support. We were very happy at IHC Delft that we had the e-learning support team uh, that were uh, ready from the beginning, uh, ready to help us as, uh, as academics with uh, implementing our, our classes but also before IHC Delft was ready uh, for e-learning and uh, had a lot of tools and knowledge ready. And it's important that that knowledge is shared. So we started the forum also for DUPC2, but also internally in IHC, we have our uh, forum on Moodle where we discuss things uh, related to e-learning. And you need to monitor and evaluate continuously uh, if your courses are achieving their uh, objectives and if things need to be tuned or if new technology comes available or the students have feedback on your uh, tools that you use. So that's important. And uh, well, if you're successful, then the students will graduate. And uh, we have proven also that you can also do an online graduation in uh, Corona times. And uh, you can see here a nice mock-up with Dutch wooden shoes where the students are holding their diploma. So that's, of course, the main goal uh, that, that we want to achieve, that they are happy graduating students. So. Um, before we uh, continue, I would like to give the floor uh, to Nadine for maybe some questions that came in. Thanks, Hans. And thank you also for the interesting presentation. Um, there are no questions yet in the chat. Okay. So hopefully they will come. I, I myself had uh, two questions. Mm -hmm. One was, you mentioned some links to documents at the start of your presentations. Will those be available? Yes, they are uh, already in the e-learning, uh, in the DPC2 uh, e-learning knowledge platform. But I think we can also add them to an uh, email where we follow up on this uh, webinar. OK, nice, good. And my second question, well, you actually already answered it somehow at the end. Um, because I'm I'm interested in how uh, it, it requires some time investment, right? To 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 learn. Uh, so how what would you say? How much does it does it take, and how can an organization support individuals? That's a, a very common question that comes up a, a lot of times. It's very hard to give an estimate of the, the real time uh, that is needed for development of your courses because it depends on many factors. It depends on uh, your own course design. Huh? How, how, how big is it? Um, it depends on how much knowledge you already have uh, about implementing it. And then it depends on the, on the support in your organization. Um, one mistake uh, that, that people make is uh, to, to take too short time for, for the development. It takes uh, generally what we learn more time to develop an online course than a face-to-face -face course. 
but uh, on the longer term you will earn it back because the renewal cycle uh, is uh, is lower so it means that once it's there it's much easier to uh, to update in the, in the e-learning platform for example in in most cases so you have to see it as an investment and also in the way that you can address many more participants than you can do in your limited face-to-face -face classes so you have a much wider scope of uh, reuse of your materials so don't be too much afraid of the investment costs which have to be made anyways because we don't know how the world is going to change uh, flying is going to be more expensive maybe there will be a second wave of corona maybe another virus in the future for sure there will be natural hazards that cut off people from their universities so um, yeah we need to be ready for these things and then already ready learning from this experience that we can't just do e emergency remote teaching but go to real uh, design of a good uh, online course yes thanks hans um well there are no questions at the moment in the chat maybe they come later i don't know if uh, walid has a question he would like to ask before we go over to his presentation well yeah, I actually have uh, many questions to ask because uh, I think this what what you were uh, describing in your presentation, which was really good, actually, I, I I learned a lot from it that I will probably be using it for the design of my own courses. But uh, uh, also, like the questions that I want to ask you, because um, kind of fall into the emergency distance teaching that in Algeria the Ministry of Higher Education had to uh, kind of um, shift towards in order to avoid uh, an entire year without education. So what happened is that uh, they took the decision of digitalizing, uh, you know, like uh, uh, teaching uh, without any what you were, because you were, you were most of the time fo um, uh, focusing on long-term strategy without, at least to what I see, uh, they, they did it with no long-term uh, strategy. So they just immediately asked uh, teachers to jump and, and just like, you know, like just uh, stream their, their courses online. Uh, without any training, uh, particularly in in the technology, and also without any uh, design, proper design for the for the learning course. So, yeah. so what I want to ask you is, uh, for an instit, uh, a capacity develop develop uh, develop uh, yeah for a for a, a university institution, for example, what could be the difficulties to actually shift uh, from normal classic classroom training towards online uh, training? I think, first of all, you need to uh, address the uh, resistance um, because, you know, if what you describe is very common, uh, also the government not, not allowing much uh, the, the transition. Uh, I, I work in countries where a maximum of 20% of the classes uh, can be online and not more. Um, so when, when we keep those restrictions, of course, people are not going to develop in a strategic way and it will be a self-fulfilling prophecy that e-learning will always be less in quality. So, and I think for, um, for universities and, and people providing courses, of course, quality is key. So you need to really go beyond uh, streaming your, your classes, but come up with a proper design and everything that you learned about what is a good class. And the change in mindset is all where it starts. It's not the money. It's really about uh, mindset first. Well, well, yeah, I, I get that point, uh, but but I also have to like uh, what happened with the Ministry of, of Algeria, for example. They gave uh, what we say carte blanche, which means that you can you can do whatever you want as long as you actually make sure that you finish the, the yearly program. You know, so yeah. they did that. It's just that from the side of of the universities, there was absolutely no kind of like understanding of how how to shift because before that there, there weren't like the infrastructure was not very good in the universities so they actually needed to make a big jump in a very short uh, short amount of time and i think that was uh, quite uh, quite quite you know like uh, difficult and i saw that how, how they were a little bit uh, kind of struggling at the beginning because they didn't know what kind of technologies to use uh, maybe i can just tell you a story what happened is that uh, they opened like a, a youtube channel like an official youtube channel uh, from the Ministry of, of, of Higher Education, or, or no, Ministry of Education, in which they stream the, 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 the lectures. And what happened is that the student, they started signaling this, uh, this, this channel until it, it stopped, you know? So, so, so they did not take into, into account that kind of factor where maybe there will be some resistance from, from the students themselves. So, and, and yeah, they needed to kind of uh, maybe they take that into account. So yeah, that was just a comment from my side, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that's common uh, everywhere in this uh, this COVID times to 
suddenly uh, start uh, experimenting with many different things and uh, also it will fire back sometimes. Uh, we've seen that in schools also in the Netherlands and we also had discussions about tools and things in, uh, in IHE. Uh, I think uh, we were lucky at IHE to be uh, ready and have a team ready uh, to have the support and it was in our strategy. And I think for those who, uh, who now have to leapfrog, who don't have it in their strategy, those countries or ministries or, or universities um, anywhere in the world, they should now think about, okay, how are we going to move to a more strategic way of, uh, of e-learning to get rid of this image that e-learning is always of low quality? Because you keep that up if you don't have a proper strategy and you don't have a group of experts uh, looking at it and have the right support. And it's dangerous. If you don't have it, you know, it's it's about knowledge of people who, who need to access uh, that knowledge in, in all times. They still need to pass their exams this year. Oh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. There, there are two more questions uh, that came in, Hans. Let's go ahead. One from Zubida Nimer. The question is, I'm trying to develop an online workshop about some presentation softwares, but I find it difficult to design the right course that suits 50 students. Any advice? Mm. Very general. It's a general uh, question. Uh, we had a previous webinar about uh, tools that you can use, uh, so different uh, platforms. Um, yeah, if you have big groups, and if I understand well, you want to let the, uh, the people uh, present and you want to judge uh, that. Um, well, either you you should be able to to break out in many different groups and uh, do some uh, use some peer uh, evaluation by the students themselves. So you give them some criteria how to deal with that. Because if you're going to do it alone and, and you have like 50 students, the online session will be very very long. Um, so either you you do use breakout rooms or you cut it into uh, pieces and spread it out over a longer time because the tension span is uh, really maximum one hour online like these webinars that's already long probably people are already falling a bit asleep and for your students uh, that, that's very tenuous so um, yeah think about good tricks how to keep the things short uh, while maintaining the quality and your objective that you want to see them presenting and online presentation skills are different than uh, PowerPoint for a big room. So maybe you want to adjust your exercise to, um, uh, to how to present yourself uh, online. And uh, we have a lot of knowledge on that uh, presented on the platform, a lot of tips how to prepare for an online presentation, etc. OK, thanks, Hans. And the second question from Guru Data. I hope I pronounce it right. And I apologize. I think my camera is not working. No problem. The, the question is, it. yeah, unlike classroom learning, online will have multiple audiences. How to decide the best fit for students for online learning? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, well, it depends on, uh, on, on your learning objectives. Uh, what do you want to teach, which should be in line with what the market wants. So if it's master students that need to get a master diploma that is uh, accredited or accredited online course they need to uh, be up to the standards uh, that, that is required for that and uh, also have the prerequisites to join the online course uh, which can be a bachelor diploma if you do a master's it can be all kinds of other entry uh, criteria um, generally that's proposed to uh, uh, potential uh, clients and e-learning it's like an online shop you propose what you have uh, with all the conditions and the learning objectives and based on that the, the student needs to make a decision uh, to pay or not to pay for that uh, and to join and um, then as a organization who provides these courses you want some checks and balances so you need to ask for for diplomas or reference or motivation letter to at least make sure that you have the right people in your class so it depends a lot if you want to do it accredited and if you want to put a lot of time uh, and, and money into the support and they pay for that, then you, of course, want a good uh, alignment. If it's about a MOOC or a uh, free online course, then uh, you can't do that. And it really doesn't matter who's on the other side of the line. Uh, then it's just about what you think yourself is the best quality you can offer with a certain means. But a really good question that needs a lot of thought in, uh, in the design. OK, I see a final question here from Bajeja Mohammed. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for this opportunity. 
what are the possible ways to get financial resources to build open source training? Um, I think it's uh, uh, it's growing uh, the uh, the amount of uh, open courseware uh, platforms are, are increasing. We also have one at IHE. Financial support is a is a difficult one. Has many uh, many aspects. So um, well, a lot of people who provide free uh, courses do that in their own time. Eh? Like my my YouTube channel, I just make a video and put it out there. So then you also don't need many financial means to do that. And you just decide on what you you want to put out there. And uh, there there has been another webinar on uh, on uh, open uh, open education and and what you could use for these things that that have a low cost. If you want your hours to be covered, then I think you need to uh, um, to attach yourself to a donor who's interested in uh, providing your course on their uh, platform. And I think there is a lot of uh, um, demand for that. You just need to find the right. Uh, platform and people for your topic. And you need to be, of course, uh, valuable for them so that they know that you can offer the right quality, even though it's an open courseware. So we are playing a bit with that in our uh, IHE uh, ecosystem. Um, so uh, we, we're probably going to host uh, guest lectures with their open courseware, but we are finding out now what's the best means uh, to do that uh, with a peer review of course materials, for example, and uh, yeah, there are certain conditions on, on how uh, open it should be. And uh, I think that that's the way forward. So yeah, look around and look for opportunities, contact the people and say, hey, I want to develop some open course or some specific expertise that I have and you need me because I'm the best in it. And then uh, deliver it or go to the other way, uh, expose yourself on uh, social media with your online course, start a YouTube channel, uh, put out documents on, on web pages, uh, look for cheap means to do that. Uh, some examples have been mentioned in the other webinar. So there are two ways. Okay, thank you, Hans. Uh, I see I have a comment here, but I will take this comment to the end because it relates also to the Algerian case. And I think it would be interesting for further discussions later on. Sure. And I think it's uh, time for uh, Valid to present his uh, Algerian experiment. We are very curious about that. So, uh, Valid, the floor is uh, yours. All right. You can share uh, the screen. Thanks a lot. Can you hear me uh, very well? Like this? Yes. Good. It works. Uh, the screen is shared, I think. You can see it? You can see the screen? Yes, go ahead. Oh. All right, go ahead. All right, thanks, thanks. All right, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Hans, for uh, for starting this uh, webinar with, with a very gr a great, um, uh, how do you call it, presentation about uh, the design of e-learning courses, which I had to deal with myself when, I, when we started uh, our uh, e-learning experiment in Algeria, which I will be talking about. Um, uh, uh, yeah, in this in the in the next fifteen minutes, I just want to start by thanking the UPC and also yourself for for do, doing these webinars, which gives actually a voice to uh, well-intentioned efforts in the global south uh, to pro pave the way for the, you know development uh, e learning development projects like ours. Um, all right, let's. Uh, all right, so I'm going to start by talking about who we are. So I represent uh, Geomatic Solutions Company. We are a, uh, a company based in Algeria. We uh, are, uh, I can say, the leading open source GIS uh, services providers in Algeria. We started doing that since 2013, after the company was founded by Mr. Uh, uh, Mohamed Safar Zitoun. Um, after uh, about uh, some, some years, we realized that, uh, uh, well, before that, we started our work because we saw that uh, GIS is an unknown and unexploited source of solutions in Algeria. Uh, so. Once we started our activities and we saw that there was, uh, it was c kind of challenging, we uh, pinpointed the problem that people did not know about the usefulness of these technologies, adding to that the usefulness of open source technologies. And uh, for that, since the late 2017, we started uh, our academy in which we, um, we teach people about uh, GIS and um, open source GIS mostly, uh, oh, no, actually only, and uh, spatial technologies. Um, yeah, so that is the company, but now I'm going to talk about myself. So why did I move towards e-learning after I graduated as a hydraulic engineer uh, from Ecole Nationale Polytechnique in Algeria and also graduating with a master's in groundwater and global change from IHE? Well, 
it's because I was, uh, uh, how to say, inspired by very, very good uh, uh, insp inspirational people and also inspirational institutions. So I was very, uh, to be honest, uh, uh, inspired by what IHE does in terms of uh, their devotion to promote e-learning and, and also open source uh, uh, solutions. Uh, that that on a side, because of course I'm I'm a, I'm a proud alumni from IHE. And also the other one is you, Hans. I mean, uh, you've always been a source of inspiration and also a source of help to uh, to develop uh, the, the kind of work that I'm doing right now. I remember in 2017, since you gave us uh, the QGIS lectures, where you were when you were defying us to actually try and find out, to try and find something that QGIS cannot do, and I took you up for it, and I I found that that it was very difficult to prove. So thanks a lot for that. And also in Algeria, I uh, it was uh, thanks to. Uh, Mohammed, Mr. Mohammed Safar Zitoun's vision since 2013 when he saw actually that it was very important to introduce open source uh, solutions in Algeria. So I partnered it up uh, with him uh, since uh, 2018. So uh, on that side, that's what we do. Now, what, what do we do in terms of teaching? So we provide offline and online and on-demand training in open source GIS and uh, 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 so, uh, spatial technologies. How do we do that? Well, we do it in sort of three formats so we have the classic classroom training that uh, that used to take like a big chunk of our activity of our teaching activity uh also in 2000 beginning of 2018 we st we we started working we worked and we finished the platform uh, an online pla learning platform on moodle uh, so it's an open source uh, uh yeah um, so, uh, so software right but then we notice that people are not that, that much interested in this and we're going to talk about the reasons why but and what we realize is um especially after the um the the imposed lockdown in in uh, during this covid 19 pandemic we uh started shifting towards uh giving video conferencing um video conferencing uh, classes which is basically just same content that we give in classic classroom but giving it uh on online just like what we are doing uh, right now so, but also, I mean, I have to admit that also we're not the only ones in Algeria. I mean, there there exist other other platforms that provide uh, online training uh, or platforms of you know, of e-learning. Although I have to mention that they they target a much broader uh, audience, so uh, they kind of have a, a bigger share of of kind of uh, of uh, of activities as compared to us. But yet still, they still suffer from the same challenges that I will mention uh, later. Also, in other countries uh, in, in, in Africa, uh, there, I, I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm familiar of one uh, because I, I was very impressed with the work that they do. Is, uh, uh, it's a platform from Cameroon. It's uh, EastMeg. And also, they do kind of similar work to what we do. So they, provide, they have an e-learning platform uh, in which they provide courses in, uh, in GIS and also spatial technology. So I, I hope in the future that we get the chance to actually collaborate with them. Um, now, so e-learning, it was kind of a bless for us to be honest. Uh, I mean, COVID-19, it was kind of a bless for us because uh, it helped us move from an unachieved dream uh, that we started in late, late 2017 to emergency distance teaching, the, what we are doing right now, to hopefully what we hope would be uh, the online norm in the future. Uh, as we can see in here, so uh, you can see, clearly see that since the beginning of the year, most of our courses were offline, so classic classroom uh, teachings to um to uh, most of it being online these days in the last uh, in the last month um uh, but the, the one thing that i have to mention is that uh, we did not have to adapt because we already had the infrastructure ready we were always promoting online uh, uh training it's just that people were not interested in it but the moment the covid 19 uh, uh came in we saw that there was a shift in people's interest towards online training so we just needed to act we just needed to build the new content for people to actually get access to and also uh, think about good learning packages for these people to be interested in. But so with all the work that we've been doing, uh, yet we still have a lot of challenge and we faced a lot of challenges that I actually wrote about in my blog post uh, that I wrote in, on Medium uh, uh, in June, so the beginning of, of June. And I was able to summarize these uh, these challenges in four, in, in for for uh, four challenges. So the face, the first one is face-to-face uh, -face is just better. This is quite a common one. You mentioned, you talked about earlier. Two other ones are related to the infrastructure, the uh, related to e-learning. But and the last one is related to fear stemming from uh, lower uh, computer literacy, which is a social uh, problem. So let's talk about each challenge on its own. So first one is that face-to-face -face is just better. 
we notice that there is a general mistrust from people towards e-learning, uh, although uh, this is kind of fading thanks to uh, the lockdown uh, in, in recent months. Uh, this mistrust uh, stems from speculation that e-learning provides a bad learning experience. So what happens is that people do not think that they would not uh, learn as good as if they are um, in the classroom face to face with the teacher. Well, I, I can understand that uh, this concern a little bit when it comes to uh, learning directly from platforms without having interactions with the teachers. But in the way how we are doing it, which is uh, simply like uh, video conferencing, it's actually as as good as as a class a cl classic classroom training, if not better. Because and also the technology makes it uh, very feasible because with uh, with screen sharing as as we are doing right now, and also speech control, you are able to actually handle uh, groups in a very good way and discussions in a, in a very good way. So challenge number two, uh, we have problems with internet connection, and that usually dissuades people from choosing to opt for e-learning options. So what happens is that we have, uh, unfortunately, bad and unreliable internet service in most of the areas of the country, except the capital and also some of the other main uh, cities. Um, that I remember that it, at the beginning it was very diff it made it very difficult for us to upload our um, uh, recorded videos to our platform in an HD format. So it actually took us uh, four days or more, and and because of the unreliability, we, were, we weren't even able to to upload them. Uh, but the good news is that with the introduction of 4G technology, it allowed for larger bandwidth and better spatial coverage. So there is a lot more accessibility for people to actually opt for these online uh, solutions. Yet, there, is still problem, there are still problems with congestion um, um, that we try to kind of avoid or at least bypass by working uh, uh, outside of, of peak hours. So either early in the morning, so for example, before people start working or, or studying or afternoon or, or late at night. Uh, challenge number three. So there is no online payment methods, and 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 this is because well, you have to know that Algeria is a cash-based society. Um, there is unfortunately an out an outdated banking system that is paralyzing not just us, not just e-learning, but also the emergence of of e-commerce. Um, and and this is quite uh, dissuading for someone, for example, to actually uh, take an online course where they can simply maybe just make a payment online, but uh, they will have to either come to our office, pay for the uh, for the course, or we kind of work, like try to bypass it by uh, implementing a mix of payment methods. So either wire transfers, for for example, at a local post office, uh, but that could be challenging because the person needs to travel to the uh, to the post office and wait uh, in long lines. Uh, so that could be dissuading. Uh, and also, uh, we try. We we are active also internationally. So we gave some online courses to people from Tunisia, France, and the Netherlands. And most of these cases, these people, uh, it is actually our courses are targeted to Algerians living in these countries. And the way how we could uh, deal with the payment method method or issue is by uh, having these people pay through a local contact, and that 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 made it possible for us. But you can imagine how this situ challenge make it impossible for us to actually extrapolate to another category of clients. Uh, the final one, which I actually did not mention in uh, in the blog, and, and it was actually pointed out to me by a friend, which is uh, a, a fear of technology. And, and this stems from, uh, unfortunately, a kind of an outdated uh, teaching programs in colleges and universities, which make people not even um, don't trust these kind of, because they are simply not used to online uh, online uh, uh, solutions so and this problem does not doesn't uh, it doesn't concern only um, older generation no no, no. It's, it's actually for people uh, between in, between their 20s to their 40s so people uh, with, who are starting their uh, careers um, I also I noticed it uh, usually I did, I, at the beginning I didn't want to think of this as a problem but I actually I, I encountered it many times when I was teaching people inside um, inside the uh, in the classroom which you mentioned earlier so it feels like we have to kind of guide the students by hand and they, they because they are they seem to be very afraid of technology so whatever there is an error uh, er error like window that pops up they completely freak out and they 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 are, they are very uh, afraid of that so and that's something that stems from this uh, lower computer um, literacy I would say but despite these 
uh, challenges. I, despite these challenges, however they difficult they may seem, it is still uh, much better in Algeria to opt for uh, e-learning than than classic classroom learning. And I, I, I also in my uh, blog post I summarize these in four points. So the first one is related to time flexibility, lower cost, and two other social uh, advantages. So let's check the first one. Most of our clients, um, potential clients, and I think this is the case everywhere, are very busy people. They have very busy schedules. So they cannot really lock three to five days to attend a classroom training, unless, the, of course, the training is offered by the institution where they're working. So this makes it very impossible for them to actually um, to, to, to do the trainings if they are not offered online. And that's why e-learning is very useful to this category of people because it allows for a flexible time management. Uh, we had to give uh, uh, trainings for people who are very busy early in the morning. So we start at 6 in the morning. Why not? Uh, it's good to, to wake up early in the morning. Um, uh, also in late evenings or whenever, whenever time is available for, for, these, uh, for these people. Another thing is related to lower cost. So what you see in here is that in this table, I'm going to try and summarize it just a little bit. You see in here, so this is the category of face-to-face -face group format, uh, group format. So basically, classical uh, format. And you have to check this column here, which is online format. I just wanted you. I want you to compare first these two. So the reference course, which is the reference course of uh, the reference price of the course. So twenty thousand dinar is basic. Is almost one hundred and forty euros just to, to get an idea. So what you see is that a classic group training is. Uh, cheaper than an online format. Why is that? An online format because because of the for, uh, because of the format that we give, which is which gets to be individual training. You know, like so that's why the the price is a little bit higher. Although it's not that high because we try to keep it low to encourage people to uh, to use it. But what happens is that in a classic format, there are additional uh, costs that are related to to the training, such as costs related to transportation, accommodation, because. I'm not talking about people who are who live nearby or or in in Algiers, the capital. I'm talking mostly about people who come from other departments who actually have to come to the capital and stay in hotels or mo or, or hostels. So they have to pay a lot of money. Uh, and when you ca account for these additional co costs, you check these two um, these two prices, and you actually find out that the online format is actually much cheaper than than the total price. So that's something that uh, that should encourage people to actually opt for online. Uh, format uh, and and when it, when it, when we're talking about the in, uh, the e-learning platform, the price is is much lower, even if we don't take into account the additional costs. Uh, the this another point, which is uh, gender learning equality, and I had to deal with this many times whenever we had to receive uh, a female client to actually re do uh, the uh, an on a course in a classic format. So basically, this female uh, this uh, woman or 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 the client. Um, most some of them come from conservative communities or conservative families, uh, and it is not maybe not very well appreciated or not allowed to actually travel alone and and stay in a hotel alone. So I had many times to spend some time try to try to like match them with a hotel or a hostel that is conservative and that meets their needs. So this particular ongoing cultural issue, which I don't want to go into the details of, uh, puts females at a dis learning disadvantage compared to, to male. Uh, but e-learning uh, e uh, actually provides more accessibility to, to these women who are living in conservative households and societies. So that's why it's actually e-learning is very good in uh, Algeria. Uh, final point, which is training uh, for citizens all over the country. Uh, Algeria tends to be a little bit centralized around its capital, but also some its of main, main cities. And that puts people who live in rural areas or not even in rural areas, but in cities outside of these main ones uh, at a... At a disadvantage to actually get access to high quality learning opportunities. And what we do is that uh, we went with the idea that, hey, we want to make sure that our product, our teaching needs to reach everywhere all over Algeria. And that's why e-learning, I think, is, is a good opportunity to actually bridge that gap between the different departments and make sure that anyone, uh, anywhere, get access to high quality anytime. Uh, finally, well, COVID-19, uh, as I noticed, is changing the way for us, uh, which is good. It's always good to see positives in, in negative situation. People in Algeria are uh, starting to trust e-learning solution, and we hope that e-learning will become the new norm. Uh, just before I finish, uh, you can follow us, of course, on Facebook, and Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, through these. You just search for us 
or you can just follow me personally on Medium. Uh, I have a, uh, I'm starting a blog there. I'm hoping to start publishing one article per month about my experience in general. And also, if you want to check all our courses that we give, you just go to our website to uh, or, or courses, and you will find everything that uh, we give. Thanks a lot. I hope I didn't take uh, longer than expected. <laughs> Thanks, Valid. All right. That was a great presentation. Uh, maybe you can stop sharing your screen, and then we can, we can see you back again. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, let's uh, see if uh, there are first questions from the, the audience. I have a few questions, but uh, Nadine, can you tell us if there are some questions from the audience? Yes, yes, yes. I'm sure you have some questions, Hans. But before before we open the floor to you, there is a question from uh, Luciana Skrin Skrinzi. The question is, through the years, what kind of problems arose in Algeria or similar countries due to a lack of access to open source GIS tools and data? Can you repeat the question through the years? Well, I didn't hear it very well. Um, sorry. So, um, oh, I lost it here. Through the years, what kind of problems arose in Algeria or similar countries due to a lack of access to open source GIS tools and data? Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So what happened is that um, uh, the problems is that we need first to understand what GIS would uh, would give us uh, as, a, as an advantage. So what we call um, the spatial advantage. So it actually gives you the possibility to uh, make better decisions uh, for whatever is spatially distributed. And that GIS is a tool what is, is used in Algeria, but mostly in engineering, uh, how to say, engineering, um, uh, 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 how to say, engineering offices or engineering companies. And they do them just to do, you know, like just basic stuff, basic analysis, just to produce maps in a very old fashioned way. But that is not fully ex actually exploring the power of GIS, which actually could be used to develop uh, tools that are, you know, like a real time, for example, a real time uh, monitoring of a certain uh, of a uh, degrading of a, of a forest, for example, or something like that. So it could be used in uh, to um, to to develop develop in the country in, in many other ways than what it is uh, done at the, at the moment uh, also uh, other uh, aside from the natural uh, from the the yeah the natural or environmental side uh, gis is not used uh, in in other areas such as marketing or public health or 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 whatever other kind of uh, uh, kind of application that could be that could benefit from the, the, uh, the from the use of gis all right I think the question was also related to uh, to open source and how it uh, it changed it. So I think you have a very nice uh, niche, uh, Valid, by uh, focusing uh, principally on, on open source uh, GIS, but also your e-learning tools are open source. Also, this webinar is open source. We use it, see, so that that's that's already correct in our uh, principles. Um, and then, yeah, uh, of course, I teach in many different countries, and I, I think that uh, you might have faced uh, the same in, uh, in, in Algeria, that, that people uh, like to stick to the stuff that they have learned, and, uh, and that's normally the, the expensive commercial software, which are also easy to get in, in those countries uh, because they don't need to really buy a license and they're not checked for, uh, for that. Uh, and uh, so that, that's a tough job for you who wants to uh, spread the word of good open source software. Uh, while people can get for free uh, cracked versions of uh, of the expensive uh, commercial software. And I know from my own experience that I uh, didn't get projects because they would say, why should we do uh, QGIS? We can all also do the other uh, thing uh, and everybody's using that. So I'm losing market on that side. Uh, how, how do you deal with that? Yeah, that's actually quite. Uh, yeah, I have to deal with uh, with these kind of questions all the time in Algeria. The way how I deal with that is, uh, uh, and it's by not promoting uh, QGIS as a as a simply a free a free uh, a free software. No, I just I, I promote it because of the benefits that you can get from it, because of how good it is, because how uh, when you compare it to propri proprietary solutions. It has a lot of advantages, and of course, I—I I, I mean, I'm not saying that it is best, better than the proprietary solutions. It's just that 
it has certain parts that are actually uh, better, just like the opposite, just like on the opposite side, this one could have a better uh, solution. So that's how I promote it. And I kind of try to uh, see what are the uh, uh, improvements in, in open source software that do not exist in, in the other one and promote it in that side. So uh, that's how I do it. It's good. It sounds a bit similar advocacy that you have for e-learning. Like, yeah, people are used to non-e-learning face-to-face, but you have a good way of, of explaining uh, to people what, what are the advantages and look at it uh, in, a, in a different way than the way they used to do. So I think that that's really good. Nadine, were there more questions? Yeah. Uh, there was another question from uh, Luciana Skinzi. She mentions, I like the idea that e-learning can help decentralize learning opportunities, taking them from the capital to more remote areas. Is particularly useful for the case of GIS learning and why? Is it particularly useful for the case of GIS learning and why? Uh yeah, I mean it's it's particularly useful GIS just like any other uh, any other software I, I would say because well these students there there are students in other in other areas that that go through the university and they're graduating with with a masters or 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 a bachelor and they don't even know what uh, what what GIS is you know so so it is useful to actually uh, allow these people give them the tools to understand what they can do with it and and also to participate in uh, more quality project and also introduce uh, tools to improve their 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 projects for example or their um, yeah or, or just self developing uh, developing themselves in a way so it is it is useful I would say just like any other uh, any other software I think I think even not only limited to uh, to software I think also to any uh, thing that you want to teach because we know that uh, yeah, especially in Algeria, but in, in many countries, the, the people who have access are concentrated in a certain economically uh, well-developed uh, area. Plus that you have within your country in Algeria, but in other countries, you have maybe similar uh, problems related to other cultural things that you have people who, uh, yeah, uh, like you said, with a gender imbalance to, to access. So, so it's a more general story, not specific to GIS. Um, the only thing that I, I'm then afraid of, which question I had in mind was, okay, if, if these people have, have difficult access to uh, to the courses that, that the people in economically uh, developed areas have, uh, how well are they then developed in uh, in the computer uh, IT thing? Your fourth challenge, which I, think, which I think was a very important one to add. We see it both with uh, students and with lecturers. Um, and we see that we have limited time in our classes to give them a boost in uh, knowledge of their own computer. and. and facilities so uh, i see that really as a big challenge oh yeah absolutely and that's why i think uh the way uh what the way how we are seeing uh, the advantages of e-learning should also apply not only to us but also to other platforms they, they should actually consider this uh as as an advantage of of their uh of their solutions that they're providing especially the ones that i that i mentioned uh as a, like in my slide that there was another uh, e-learning platform that is called uh, formini and they provide more general skill computer skills, so like programming, Excel, uh, you know, like Microsoft stuff. Uh, so, so they should maybe just also like take into account the impact that they will do in in, in other kind of in other areas of and the develop. So the combination of these two would actually allow these people to to actually improve. Yeah. I would say that we we need to invest uh, in in the face to face traditional learning more in getting people ready in the tech, technological skills for computers. I think it's so general in, in the 21st century that everybody needs to know how a computer works yeah, and what you need to get online and, and find your files and, and share your camera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so that they are ready because I was thinking if you offer it as uh, prep courses, then yeah, they should also know already how to run those prep courses online. So that's, that's a bit of a yeah. different story. Yeah, that, that would require like, uh, um, as I said, like also the, the, the programs at university are, are outdated. So they're also like, I think if that is kind of like readjusted and updated to, to the current uh, technologies and what is available, I think that would help uh, a lot. So, so more focus should be put in, in that uh, as well. There's, there are more questions here. So we're, we're already uh, a bit, uh close to four o'clock but uh, i think we have some time if you if you have some time left sure kambidi cox 
has a question. First, excellent presentation. Thank you. Do these early e-learning platforms support breakout sessions for group work? Also, do you encourage one-on-one -on -one meetings similar to office hours for students? In addition to that, with the above, students can better access the full classroom experience and avoid the isolating factor with some e-learning experiences. So that's, I don't think that's a specific question for you, Walid, but uh, go ahead. Uh, you are muted. Walid, you're muted. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I would say that that more of a, of, of a comment and I appreciate that. Um, it's, uh, yeah, well, maybe I didn't understand the question to be honest still. So, so maybe Hans, if you can just uh, maybe answer it. Yeah, I think, I think the case for you and me are, are similar, Valid, on this. So the, the question uh, was about if the tools also allow uh, breakout sessions and uh, what would be a good approach to, to also prevent that students feel very isolated uh, while doing uh, online courses. Yeah. Uh, it's part of the package. So uh, we both use a big blue button, for example, which allows uh, breakout groups. So you can, uh, like in physical rooms, you can uh, give your students uh, uh, group work in separate groups, and you can even as a lecturer visit those virtual uh, rooms to, uh, to deal with them. And you will have the plenary running, so people can also go back there to search for you uh, virtually. So, so that's there. If students have questions outside of class, it depends a bit on how you organize your e-learning, but normally you put that into the support that, uh, well, in, in the worst case, um, that, that they can make an appointment with you. And then you use uh, a tool like Yitzi to, um, uh, to help them out with their problem. In the, the emergency remote teaching, you would have your big blue button all the time, op time open and people put in the chat their question. And if you can't figure it out with GIS, you would say, okay, please share your screen. Uh, then the whole group who is present can, can, see, uh, can see it, which has some advantages. Uh, but uh, the, the disadvantage is that you have to be online the whole day if you teach four hours, uh, four periods. That, uh, the, I had that experience a few times. And even it can be that you are uh, all the time doing nothing with the class because there's no question coming up. Because there's a risk that people just log in because they have their name there and they stay under the radar. So it has some perverse uh, impacts. Another thing that I forgot to mention, which is very important and came up a lot of times in discussions, is uh, that students also expect you to record these streaming sessions. Um, I think that's not a good idea. Probably there will be now hundreds of new questions in the YouTube about that because I disagree with that. I will probably also get bad evaluations because of that, but I simply refuse it. Because there is psychological and pedagogic proof that when people make notes, that they uh, learn just simply by making the notes, not even looking back at it. There's some brain activity. Well, if you're just there watching something that's also going to be recorded, and if it's long, you will lose the attention span. So the better way is to, again, package your lectures into shorter videos and use the real-time uh, experience for uh, interaction and, uh, and, and quizzes, etc. So my point of view, and we, we can argue that, I love to argue that, is it's a very bad idea to record every big blue button session and give it to the students. Uh, all right. Uh, oh, yeah. All right. Good. good. Yeah. But Do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I was just going to say that what, what Hans was describing is are, are actually uh, the kind of issues that arised when when uh, there was this shift towards emergency teaching in, in, in Algerian University. So and these are exactly the kind of problems that, that occurred is that also, students they they simply just logged in to show that they are present, but they they, they were not there, and they just counted on um, the the recorded sessions that will have they will have uh, available uh, later. So that completely, you know, like it just basically if you're if you're gonna miss something during the lecture, just postponing it to stress you even more later. You know, like when you when you're gonna see it again in that video. So uh, so yeah, I think these are exactly like good good uh, described problems that uh, uh, we observe. Okay, there's a question from uh, Guru Data. How is the reception of learning by the government departments? Do they enroll for learning online? So I think you can answer this from, from your uh, experience from the local context, I guess. Um, well, so, so what I understood is that, uh, so uh, people from governments, how do they, uh, how do they accept yeah. learning? Like, yeah, uh, and if yeah. they enroll. 
for those uh, courses? Well, uh, to be honest, I've uh, we haven't had that chance actually yet to uh, to actually be providing uh, courses to towards uh, uh, people from the private uh, uh, no the the public sector. So uh, we didn't we didn't get that. So most of our work is done to other businesses. So we teach. Uh, staff from other businesses from from the private uh, sector or individuals, but we didn't get that uh, opportunity to do it with the public se uh, public sector. Although lately, uh, with our increased visibility, they've been interested in what uh, what we are doing, and uh, I think that only means that we are doing a great job at promoting e-learning, and that's that's good. So I, I've had some contact; uh, they are contacting me to just send them some proposals about what they can, uh, how they can include e-learning in their to their to the train of their staff. Uh, I would like to add to that uh, because I think that's a very interesting and, uh, and good question. Uh, um, we, we did uh, some, uh, we asked some questions also to, to academics uh, in, in one of our face-to-face -face, uh, uh, sessions that we had before the, the crisis in, at IHE, like how many of you have followed uh, e-learning courses? And then almost nobody who teaches has followed themselves e-learning courses. So it's very hard to then rely on your instinct how an e-learning course should look like. You need really some, some experience with that. And from the learner point of view, we also see that um, uh, now we are writing, of course, proposals for trainings, and we see that uh, civil servants uh, have a, and donors have a different uh, expectation of, of a course. And e-learning is certainly not automatically one that they would think of. So often uh, they will still budget neutrally extend a project that you will uh, hopefully after the, the corona is gone can implement it face to face or they will cancel it. They will not too easily go to the online mode because for them it has some other advantages also to do it face to face. There is of course the, the advantages of going with your group to another country or, or another place. There is uh, all kinds of incentives, financial incentives to follow classes. So it's a, it's a difficult, complicated topic. But moving online, we can remove a lot of perverse um, financial incentives in the uh, the learning uh, also of civil servants. Thank you, Hans and Valid. There, there's another question from Guru Data. If the medium of learning is not necessarily English, but the software used is in English, how to handle the clash during e-learning sessions? Yeah, that's a that's a good question because we provide our our uh, training. Uh, well, in our case, we provide it in 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 French and uh, in Arabic, and most of the tools that we use. Well, luckily, they they do have a French option to it because it's a it's a commonly used language. But when it is Arabic, uh, what what I notice we have to do is actually uh, just provide tutorials or actually just make sure that we are guiding the student at any uh, at any point where where they don't know. How to use a certain tool because of the language difference. So we 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 certainly provide them with, uh, for example, like tutorials on 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 PDF or something like that that they know how to uh, how to use it. So that's that's how we are dealing with it uh, um, on our side. Yeah, but uh, yeah. I, do, do you do you use the the, uh, the Arabic interface of uh, QGIS? Uh, that's the a language. Good no no we don't because it's not that complete uh so we just have like certain parts that are translated and it's not that complete but what we are doing because i'm also uh trying to lead the uh ugis uh, uh i mean Q, QGI, qgis uh user group and uh we're starting we had our first meeting to kind of like the, define what we are what we're going to be doing for 2020 2021 and one of the major uh contributions that we want to do is, is actually to translate arabic and also translate to uh, the Algerian native language, Amazigh. So we're, we're, we're hoping to do that. Uh, that would be great. Time. That would be yeah. really great. And I think a great contribution from your uh, user community to do that, uh, because the software has uh, also volunteers translating through a system which is called Transifex, where you simply get pieces of text that you need to translate in your language. So it's already available in many languages. But the question is indeed uh, uh, good. Um, it depends also on where people are going to work. So if they're learning GIS and they want to work in an international job, then it's better that they use the English interface. Yeah, but um, since the crisis, I've been working with the Dutch community and I saw all the funny translations of technical terms in QGIS because they use the Dutch version, which I never learned and never used. <laughs> okay, thanks. 
Um, well, there was the final question. There are some there are some comments just in the chat uh, about e-learning in Algeria. It is mentioned that uh, different. I think there are different experience. That it's mentioned that uh, it it takes off, that things are starting to change, and someone else mentions that it is the first uh, time that they heard of e-learning in uh, Algeria. So um, yeah. Interesting. I think it was very interesting also to hear the from you, Ali, the specific case in in Algeria on this topic. And uh, I think there's there's really a lot of potential for this uh, uh, for this development in in Algeria, but in many other countries to 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 to, to, to take off and further uh, invest in too. So Hans, I I I, I leave it to you and uh, Walid now to close off some final words. Thanks a lot, Nadine. Thanks a lot for taking the questions from YouTube. Uh, I, I haven't seen, uh, of course, the, the YouTube chat. It's on, a, on another site and we look at, but it sounds like there have been some, uh, some lively attendance and that, that's great. So also thanks to the, the participants of this webinar for, for posing the, the, the questions and uh, give us a nice uh, debate here at the end of the session. Uh, my uh, thanks go uh, mostly to uh, to Walid, of course, uh, having seen him as a, as a student in the GroundWatch program and now having this role in Algeria and the company uh, really uh, also inspires me again to uh, to keep up uh, the good work and to learn also from your experiences. So I'm sure we, we will do a lot together in the future. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Hans. Uh, you've always been a good source of uh, inspiration and also of help. Uh, so I appreciate that. And uh, I thank you a lot. And you have to keep going. Uh, you have to keep going with this. <laughs> I know it's challenging sometimes, but yeah, you have to. You have all my support. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Malit. Thanks to see you as a pioneer in your country. Thanks. Uh, so with these nice words, uh, I would like to close uh, the webinar. Thank you all for your attendance. This has been the last one before our summer break, but I'm sure we'll be back uh, soon with some more uh, nice activities keep you posted.